Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Let's Talk Yoga podcast. I hope you are doing well. I cannot wait to tell you about today's podcast episode. But first, I'd like to get some updates out of the way. Now, starting in October, you will see a lot of online courses coming up. There will be two master classes, one with Vikramjeet Singh and another one with Prasad Rangnekar. These will be open to enrollments. Uh, so you could potentially be in a Zoom room with us in uh, literally a couple of months. So keep an eye out for that. I'll start talking about them in October and enrollments for them will open as well. And on the other side, my online courses, the Pranayama Yoga Teacher Training and Immersive Study Program, as well as my annual Teaching Yoga to Beginners will also be opening for enrollments. Okay, so I've taken a little like, extra time to redo some of those dates. So all of these will be available to you throughout October. We'll be releasing Vikram and Prasad's courses first and followed by the Teaching Yoga to Beginners then ending the year with the pranayama studies so that's coming up make sure you are signed up for our newsletter go to the link in the podcast description or on the show notes that's where i will be sending it out to a very targeted audience who's really immersed in yoga studies so make sure you get on that okay now before we move on to today's episode have you been listening to the let's talk yoga podcast for a while and have you shared this with at least one friend I hope, I hope you will take a moment, especially today's episode, to share it uh, with your yoga friends and even your non-yoga friends, anyone who wants to live a little more mindfully. On the show, Nidhi Pandya is back. If you remember, we did a podcast with Nidhi a few months ago about yoga and Ayurveda. I will link to that in the show notes. That was of so much value to you as the listener. So I'm hoping that uh, you will give that a listen after you get through today. Today, we're talking about what eating like a yogi looks like. We're exploring the relationship between yoga, yogis and food. Okay, and Nidhi is an Ayurvedic healer based in New York City. She has Ayurveda in her life. It's generational wisdom. And you'll hear her talk about it in today's show. She was raised like me in India. And she has been immersed in Vedic wisdom ever since birth. Okay, her grandfather was an Ayurvedic healer himself, and she has been working nonstop in sharing Ayurveda with the rest of us. She is very passionate about empowering people to become self-aware, and she's not someone who just tells you Ayurvedic information. She makes it relatable. She breaks it down. She gives you context, and her strength lies in her ability to understand ancient scriptures and make them applicable. Um, for the modern world, uh, which is why I really enjoy what Nidhi does. And she's an international yoga teacher. She's a speaker. She's a coach. Um, she writes for various publications. And I am so glad that she was on the podcast yet again. And she's also launched a new set of masterclasses that she talks about at the end of today's episode. So if you have ever been curious about what eating like a yogi means, what is yoga's relationship with food, then make sure you listen to this episode. I have linked to Nidhi's Instagram profile, her website, her new courses, everything at letstalk.yoga forward slash listen. Enjoy the show. I'll see you on the other side. Hi, Nidhi. Welcome back to the Let's Talk Yoga podcast. Thank you so much, Anandati. It's always such a joy talking to you and such an honor. I have been looking forward to this topic for a few months now, and I'm actually glad that we're finally doing this. I get at the yoga studio, I get so many questions about the role of food uh, because people have some knowledge of Ayurveda um, and they're like, how should I eat? What should I be eating? And I'm no expert to tell people any of that. So I'm glad you are here. Can we <laughs> take things off by understanding, according to Ayurveda, what is the role of food in our lives? Okay, so we are made of, firstly, anything that comes that's existing on the planet, you know, things there's matter and there is energy, right? Even matter has the potential for energy. Let me just tell you that, right? But we are, we as beings are also made of matter and energy. Mm -hmm. 
So we, how do we nourish ourselves constantly? How every single day cells kind of are degenerating and dying and new cells are being regenerated every day. Raw material is needed for that maintenance of your body. You, you can't just say, hey, I'm, a, I'm an adult now, I need to stop eating, right? Mm-hmm. We don't do that. Every day we need new raw material in our system. And that has to be, again, like I said, a combination of matter and energy. Right. But it has to have matter as well. I mean, there are there are people, there are certain types of yogis who can do okay with sunlight and they actually don't need that matter. They're only functioning on that energetic realm. But we're not talking about that. So the role of food is to nourish your body at all levels and provide raw material for new cell cells. And and you know, I mean, every cell has DNA. So every mm-hmm. cell has energy potential as well um that is what the main role of, of food is I, I do want to say right here is that there are three pillars of health in, in ayurveda it's ahar mm-hmm. it's nidra and it's brahmacharya and if you want we can talk a little bit about why these three work in tandem sure so ahar is what will um we are using our bodies all day yeah. long yeah but there are three ways in which we replenish our body mm-hmm. one is ahar is through food is through nidra through sleep and brahmacharya becomes important because what we are losing in brahmacharya is basically regulated intercourse losing mm-hmm. depleting essential fluids of our body mm-hmm. and this especially holds true of a man because the essence if you see in ayurveda the essence of everything you eat, the essence after all your tissues have been nourished, that's when your shukra dhatu or your reproductive fluids then kind of get the juiciest bit of you, right? Because it's saying, hey, after I've given you life, after I've given all your tissues life, do you still have some, do you still have juice for more life? Mm -hmm. Because your reproductive tissues provide that juice for more life. Mm -hmm. And when people are depleting a lot of their reproductive tissues, you know, by having repeated intercourse several times a day, when people are addicted to uh, to sex, then you're kind of losing out on that energy. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as we are beings, we're always at work. We're always using our energy. The food and the sleep and restrained amount of depletion of bodily fluids will allow mm-hmm. us then to build our energy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, fascinating. Um, and uh, just last week, we had uh, a conversation about Brahmacharya uh, in depth on the podcast. So this is, this. I'm hoping the listeners will uh, put two and two together on this one. But you said something about um, food feed, feeds all the layers of our being. Uh, are you referring to something specific here? No, so basically, we are made, right? So what keeps us alive is breath right what do you lose it's that essential life force you can call it breath you can call it prana Mm -hmm. you can call it that living element what makes let's say something that's made of calcium carbonate different from let's say a food that's high in calcium right like but but if i I take a statue that's made of calcium carbonate that's come from like rocky matter on earth and i call it an inanimate object i say that this does not contain life And then if I look at, let's say, you know, something else that's food, like sesame, and I say, hey, this is high in calcium, Mm -hmm. but it's living. I mean, it is a food source. It has come, it has come as a food source. So whenever things come as a food source from a living source, from Mm -hmm. a living place, they also have that element of life in them. And Mm -hmm. we have that element of life. And you can call that prana. Mm -hmm. You cannot replenish life unless you get it from life. And and the basic principle of Ayurveda is Samanya Vishesha Siddhanta. What this Siddhanta or principle says is that you want to replenish anything in in your body, you get something that is as close to it from outside. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever it is, you want to replenish replenish fluids in your body, then you get fluids from outside. Yeah. You want to rep- replenish grounding, then you do something that's going to add that grounding. Mm-hmm. So if you want to bring life, if you want your food to, to enhance your life potential, then you need to eat food which has life. But that being said, you want food that nourishes your senses. You want food that mm-hmm. nourishes your soul, that nourishes your palate, that nourishes your appetite, that nourishes your mind. And I'm not saying that's possible at every meal. Yeah, but it's definitely something that we all need to think about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. As you're saying, 
these what I call these layers, I'm thinking of the koshas. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And drawing a parallel with the pranamaya kosha. So speaking of prana, um, can we explore that a little bit? Hmm. Is there a connection between the ahara, the food, and prana? Because growing up, I remember my grandma telling me, you know, food has prana. And we can, and you have to be really mindful of that. So can we have a conversation about that? Is there prana in food? And what does that really mean? So there is no, prana is not in all foods because okay. we eat, foods can get depleted of prana. I mean, it, mm. like in the Ayurveda world, I would not even call it food anymore, right? If something which is so processed, so far away from its original living state, I'm going to say that's that's devoid of prana and that's not really food that is to be eaten for nourishment. You can eat it for joy once in a while. I'm not going to take that away from you. But prana, right? If I'm going to support the life force in my body, I need to have it from a place that has life force. For example, I will take cooked lentils. I will take fresh vegetables, things that have the ability to decay. Mm, okay, because our bodies also decay. The fact that something is decaying means that there is still presence of life. Like this book is going to get wear and tear. I'm just holding a book in my hand, right? But it's not going to decay. True. Mm. Right? But it, if it, the fact that it can decay means it has life in it. Mm. So mm. you almost want food that has the evidence of life. Now, I want to say a couple of things here. Sure. For, for prana to be successfully released, you require agni for most foods, mm. not fruits. Fruits are ripened by the sun. Fruits are cooked by the sun. Mm. But a lot of other foods, right? Like your lentils, your rice, even your vegetables, for release of prana, for that activation to happen, for your body to make use of that prana, the fruits need to be cooked. I want to say one more thing, right? So I have people who say, hey, you know, I've cooked for today and I'm going to keep it in the refrigerator and I'm going to eat it tomorrow. That's prana less fruit. I'll tell you Gosh, why. I'm guilty of it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, Arundhati, I'm actually very lenient about a lot of things which people don't, uh -huh. they think I wouldn't be. This is the one thing I'm not lenient about at all. Okay, good to know. Uh, because I'll tell you why, okay? It's like saying that, hey, somebody has gone into coma because what happens when you put it in the fridge, the decay, the breakdown stops. You actually mm. freeze it. You make it fossil, Correct. you know? Because you're like, uh, you know, I want you to stop the life force. Like, hey, food, stop your function of life, which is decay. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to try. And it's never quite the same. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying never do it. I'm not saying even though, honestly, I probably do it once in 365 days, if at all. Uh, okay. <laughs> you're my me. inspiration. I think of you. Honestly, <laughs> if there's anything, anything that I like, the, the one thing that I, I don't, there's a couple of things that I absolutely will not do. And this is definitely one of them. Okay. Right. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm okay with using a crock pot. I'm okay with making things simpler. So anyways, I'm uh, get, getting back into it. Yeah, so things, foods that, are, that, that have the ability to decay and rot for the most part, have prana in them mm -hmm. uh, you need to cook foods for the prana to really emerge out of those foods mm -hmm. uh, for you know for you to start making use of it if you put foods in foods in the refrigerator you've kind of they become kind of devoid of prana because they're mm -hmm. like they kind of die and then you kind of bring them back to life yes mm -hmm. that does not there are certain foods right for example there's certain indian foods that dried snacks or like even a laddu Mm. They they do have prana. I'm not going to say they don't like because sometimes they have dried fruits. Sometimes it's a roasted flour. You yeah. put agni to it. And even those, if you notice, they won't last forever. True. They're in the drier forms and they will still have prana, even though their decay is slower. So they mm. do de because somebody would argue that, hey, but like ladus, for example, uh, you know, don't decay. Uh, yeah, but they at some point they have an expiration date. They don't have. Yeah, super I was just thinking they do decay at some point. Yeah. Yeah, like and and, and very stale. quickly. Yeah, mm. yeah, and like very quickly actually. They, they they don't have a. The longer the shelf life, honestly, the lower the prana. Understood. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. So, you mentioned, you know, fruits are cooked by the sun, and so can we talk about cooked food here, right? Yeah. Because. Um, I, in my naive understanding, uh, raw food is harder to digest or does Ayurveda look at cooked food and raw food differently? Sarandhati, 
raw foods for the most part are not to be consumed. And I'll tell you how you can consume them. Now let's just let's just leave Ayurveda aside for a second. But if you just do a simple simple research on what when did humans start to cook use fire to cook their foods and what happened to their bodies? Okay, if anybody does that little Google search, mm. you'll find several articles that say that when we started using fire to cook our foods, that is when we actually evolved into this this species that we are today the homo erectus because what happened that our gut that was now having to do so much and like imagine if you kind of ate a whole like you went you took a head of broccoli and you bit into it i mean can you imagine the amount of work your gut would have to do yeah so when it's we gotta started cook it break it down all of it yeah i mean honestly the end result what you see in your toilet looks pretty much the same but now you're having to do all that work mm. So basically, our gut became smaller because we had our, you know, cooked foods allowed a different microbiome. Our brains became bigger. We actually have become human because we started to cook our foods. Why would we go back? It causes a great dysbiosis of the gut bacteria, like dysbiosis of the gut if you are, uh, if you consume raw foods for long periods of time. I also want to say one thing. I mean, nobody can say that, hey, I was stuck in a jungle in an orchard that was full of fruits and amazing veggies and arugula growing everywhere and spinach growing everywhere. Would you feel nourished after a few weeks of just eating that food? Probably not. All our comfort foods are warm and moist. Yes. All mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. our beings are warm and moist our breath is warm and moist we mm -hmm. we are that's that is what has made us human eating raw mm -hmm. is going back to being primitive it's mm -hmm. what this is what sets us apart that being said certain foods you you enjoy the rawness you want the crispness it's a sum, summer day add some olive oil and vinegar and 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 black pepper and for sure, go for it as a small portion. It can do well when you go for it as a part of a bigger meal. But if you rely upon those raw foods to be the essential source of nourishment, there is a problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think um, especially I, I don't eat salads. Let me just publicly uh, uh, say this. Yeah, that's the two of us. Uh, right. And for my vata imbalance, I, I know salads is not the best thing unless it's a warm cooked salad. Right? Then yeah, that is not a salad. Like then, that's, then to me, those are cooked veggies. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what I want to a question I want to ask is, is something I think the listeners will probably because a lot of them eat salads. Even when I'm sitting in teacher training, a lot of them are eating salads, and people are drinking green juices. So um, the body cannot process that broccoli if we just bit into it. But what is your take on you know green juices and smoothies? Um, anything there? Yeah. So, I mean, they're both different. Let's talk about green juices first. Green juices that are made exclusively of green leafy veggies like kale, etc. For a short period. So their exact effect on the body is a scraping effect. People who've had increased viscosity of their blood, so which means they have cholesterol, they have high blood pressure, they have sugar, which means there's a kind of sliminess in their blood. Mm. and you know obesity everything has become thicker anything that's mm. become thicker they're overnourished when they have green juice the green juice does a great job of scraping everything interesting okay no but i i have to finish this right but what happens is that so they start seeing drastic results very quickly they're like oh my mm. god i lost weight my blood pressure yes. came down my mm. this happened my that happened but there is a sweet spot where you stop mm. because after that point the green juice will start to deplete your mucus lining, your bone mass. We have a lot of essential soft fluids in our body. It's like saying that I've brushed my teeth so much, now my plaque, my, just to remove the plaque, but my enamel has also gone off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what often happens in the green juice world. As an Ayurvedic doctor, I would not even go there. I would not even recommend green juices. I would I would use powders of bitter greens, churnas, mm. and I would put them into a combination which feels safe. And I'd say, you know, let's do that. Right? There is neem, there is turmeric, there's lots of other things, you know, that that we that we use, katuka, that we would use then and we would use it in a combination. So that you would have the same effect, the same scraping effect without the without tipping over to the other side, mm -hmm. where you scraped off your enamel, you scraped off the nice soft fluids. 
Smoothies are a different story. Smoothies uh, don't work like green juices. Smoothies, usually people put bananas, people put coconut, people put yogurt, people put all kinds of things. So yeah. they're more slimy. They're not screaming mm. in your body. They're more slimy. They're more filling. The problem with smoothies is this, that there's golden temperature for the most part. Yeah. And I think they're fine if you want to drink them for fun. You know, you may even just have like room temperature fruit and put them all together and say, hey, I'm just, this is fun for me. I'm going to drink a smoothie. Go for it. I'm not going to say that it has a really great health benefit. If you drink smoothie in the morning, firstly, let me tell you this, like really it's taken me a lot of bravery for the last three years. I have been saying this and in the beginning, I got a lot of backlash. You don't eat fruit in the morning oh i'm with you on that okay yeah because it's cold and soggy outside and our mm -hmm. bodies are a reflection we are very much aligned as circadian rhythms of what's outside so you don't eat fruit first thing in the morning you can eat it in the day so smoothies are they're also cold and slimy just how the dew is just how you see morning congestion your body is cold and slimy in the morning and uh, consuming smoothies then is going to really slow your system down even more. People tell me that, oh my God, all I needed was one smoothie and I was not hungry till two. Of course, you won't be yeah. hungry till two because your metabolic activity has shut down because your gastric juices are now in a puddle. Mm. So you think it's a good thing because your caloric intake has gone low. But what we've actually done is everything, our immunity, our, our endocrine system, our hormones, our overall, our sleep, our overall our well-being is so strongly associated with our gut and our microbiome. You've kind of killed that in the morning, they're in a puddle. So that's my issue with smoothie. If you want to do it in a nice summer day, go for it in the afternoon. Don't keep it cold because as far as possible, Oh, as far as possible, I'm not going to say everything, right? I think people should have their indulgences, but as far as possible, foods should be warm mm -hmm. or at least room temperature. Mm -hmm. And when you have cold beverages, lots of icy stuff, we basically essentially make our gut into a refrigerator and in the refrigerator, nothing breaks down. Mm -hmm. That's a good way of remembering it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I'm glad you clarified that. So if we went back in time and explored how yogis ate and what was their relationship to food, can we get into that a little bit? Yeah. So, you know, this is one of the things that I say around that these days, everybody wants the, the Zen of the yogi, but the life of Without, a warrior. Yeah. Right. So we want to be on the body. We want to be high achievers. We want the intensity. Listen, the warrior was not built for longevity. The mm -hmm. warrior was built for intensity. He was ready to go to the battlefield and die. He ate meat. He was intense. He was fiery. You know, in fact, he didn't practice a lot of analysis paralysis because he would not be on the battlefield to take quick decisions. He would not be able to do it. Um, so we all want to live like warriors, but still have the Zen of the yogi. Uh, and the yogi essentially was not just and you know you and I know this and I'm sure your listeners do too the yogi was not somebody who just went to yoga class even yeah. though even though every yoga asana class I feel gives you those lovely moments of zen because your breath and your body you just come in so much in the present moment right so you lose sense of self but the yogi essentially his life was chasing the loss of sense of self mm like in a very healthy manner, in a manner of routine and, you know, the yam niyamas and everything. So, and, and we experience glimpses of that in, in a, an asana class, right? So anyways, the, the, so the yogi ate just for that. So he ate for longevity. He didn't eat for intensity. Mm -hmm. Now, while it is debatable, some of the foods that a yogi, the yogi definitely had a sattvic diet. Definitely. Can you clarify what is a sattvic diet for yeah. the listeners? Yeah, so um, it's going. So I'm, I'm going to go into sattvic, rajasic, and tamasic because then it becomes easier to understand sattvic. So let's say sattvic is a diet which is not heating up your system and aggravating your mind. Also, it is it is an anti-inflammatory, cooling, moist diet. So your foods could still be warm, but it's it's going to bring comfort, purity to your body. And I'm going to just give you examples of it. For example, simple fresh cooked rice with a little bit of ghee and salt. Plain lentils, which are not too spicy, which don't have a lot of garlic, 
don't have onions because onions and garlic are pungent. If you've ever accidentally eaten a piece of garlic, you know it's very pungent. So it's a spice-free, anger-free, violence-free, more, more white foods like rice, like ghee, like milk, like green fleshy veggies, a little bit of Himalayan salt, you know, khichri, all of those foods, right? And every 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 international cuisine has certain foods like that. I've just used some Indian Indian names like khichri, but it, you know, you could you could eat mujadara. You could make a mujadara with you know uh, brown lentils and rice, and that could that could be sattvic, as long as it's with these principles in mind that you're not using garlic, onions, and anything that has caused violence to a multi-sensory being. So mm-hmm. yes, plants are also living but they're not multi-sensory beings. But if you have, so for example, now if I've eaten, the, the, the second group is Rajasik. Rajasik is what the warrior ate. The warrior had to need intensity. He needed anger. He needed muscle. He needed all, so high protein, high meat, mm. uh, you know, ginger, garlic, all of that, but still fresh, fresh, spicy, inflammatory, intense diet. Mm-hmm. A tamasic diet, which kind of leads to inaction. So the sattvic diet leads to being in the present moment. The mm-hmm. rajasic diet leads to action. Mm-hmm. And the tamasic diet leads to inaction. So if I'm eating a lot of cold foods, if I'm eating a lot of ice cream, stale foods, which don't have prana, they take the life force out of you. So, you know, a lot of processed foods, lots of junk foods, excess amounts of meat which is not nicely cooked or processed you're just you're living in a mental cloud Mm. right so the energies you feel i'm just going to say one more the energy that you feel with tamsik is lethargic lazy denial depression fear shame guilt all of these rajsik is anger passion desire all of that and for the sattvic it's a simplicity of surrender and gratitude and compassion and just really losing that sense of self. To me, this, these three groups, they're fascinating. Mm. And I like how you said with Tamasik, there is uh, shame because everybody's like, they, they binge and then they feel guilty about it. And then we go on a trip, but I don't want to go there. I want to pick up something else you said. You mentioned meat a few times and at least in the yoga circles that I'm part of sometimes there's this talk of do do we need does be doing yoga mean you only eat a vegetarian diet and can we talk about that because a lot of Indian people eat meat and Ayurveda also has meat in it doesn't it so Aranthati I will tell you that um Meat has its very important place in Ayurveda. Meat fat, bone fat, uh, you know, like bone marrow and mm-hmm. meat fat, right? So there are four fats. There is ghee, there is oil, mm-hmm. there is fat that comes from meats. You know, if you cook a piece, and there is bone marrow. These are the four fats. And in some places, bone marrow has a very important role. And there's other meats, you know. But is meat for, I, I myself am vegetarian, but I'm going to keep that out for non-bias. M- is meat for everybody? The meat is not for everybody. Yes, for certain dosha types, meat does not work well at all. But more than that, and beyond that, right? What, even for a yogi, just because we are Indian, Arundhati, does not mean you're yogis. The yogi is on a path, he's on a different pursuit altogether. Like we said, like the way, the best way I could say is that the yogi is constantly chasing, losing sense of self, feeling one with the universe. And to that means less action, more surrender. Meat is rajasik. Firstly, the animal has, animals are in survival. They're in the jungle, they're always alert. So their chemical, comp- like we know, you and I both know that as every thought dumps a chemical in our bloodstream, mm-hmm. you're stressed, there's, oh my God, sudden cortisol. You're excited, there's sudden adrenaline. You're happy, there's endorphins. You're sleepy. So every thought, however you're feeling, depends on what your chemical um, composition is. The animal is running, chasing, assessing, calculating. You, the flesh of that animal is going to bring those qualities in your being and that is not the yogi's chase 
the yogis chase a sense of self. Now, if you come to a yoga class and you're exploring asana, you're in a different place. Doing one hour of yoga versus living the life of a yogi is different. Yes. And I think we're all making that journey. So I think there is no absolute rule. In fact, I think some of the biggest mistakes that I genuinely feel people, yoga teachers more than anybody do when I see them teaching class is eating right before a yoga class, is drinking coffee. I mean, that is blasphemous. You know, your food choices come second, but the order of food and what that's going to do to your body is even worse, right? So I tell, I mean, basically, this is my theory, right? Like, you be very honest about where we are in our journey. Say, I'm not ready to give up the world. Yes, yeah. I'm practicing yoga in the morning, and I'm still going to work, and I'm still running, let's just say, you know, a million dollar business, and I still want, it's okay, you be fair, right? I think it's very important to be fair as to where we are, because we can be doing all at the same time. We're all exploring. The child is always in play. The adult can be at work and in play. You know, we are we we have, can have these multiple roles at any given point. Mm -hmm. And um, um, you, I would remind listeners often that we're not yogis in the true sense. Ours is very. It's a very relative relationship. Uh, but am I right? When I think a friend of mine who does some Ayurveda said this once: "You are not what you eat. You are what you digest." Yeah, I actually said that several times myself as well. Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, does, does the food we eat affect the quality of our mind and our thoughts? You Okay. Uh, so that statement is completely different that you are not what you eat, you're what you digest. What that, when I say it, what that means is that you and I by, both might say, hey, I'm going to, you know, eat this like great almond let's just say this almond dish which is going to give me this vitamin e and it's going to do this for me but i might eat it and be like oh my god my tummy hurts i can't digest it i'm going to throw up and you might eat it and be like oh wow i feel amazing okay. like okay. every promise is fulfilled so uh -huh. really i i ate it for the same reasons but i didn't have the same reaction so because mm -hmm. I couldn't digest it. So you may, so we make a lot of food choices based on this is supposed to be good for me. That is supposed to, no, doesn't matter what it's supposed to be for you. If you can't digest it, you're not going to use it. Fair enough. Yeah. That's what that statement really means. But at the same time, your question that do we, what we eat, does it affect our mind? Yeah. When we talk about sattvic, rajasik, tamsik, that's exactly what it does. Right. So if you eat some, if you eat spicy food, it's just going to generally raise the inherent temperature of your body. And you are likely to be more engaged, more alert, more. I mean, caffeine is the best example. Yeah. Because what caffeine does, right? We have caffeine, which is dehydrating. What does that mean? Hot and dry. And it makes your, your mind sharp for a few minutes. Exactly hot and dry. Sharp mm -hmm. is exactly that. It's hot and dry. So alcohol will make you like ah, oh, i'm forgotten sense of self so just how alcohol and caffeine and you might feel those sooner every food we consume has an effect on our internal environment our mind feeds our body but our body also feeds our mind constantly it's a two-way relationship and yeah what you eat therefore will affect your mind as well mm -hmm. okay thank you for clarifying that um i always thought of it a little differently like what you eat what you digest yeah. but this is uh it is subjective to each person yeah. so what about the because i feel like yogis ate two meals a day um and they ate a certain amount of food i feel like modern day we eat all the time there's no that discipline is a little different and i'm generalizing so what about the frequency of our meals and what we should eat and the quantity of food is there okay. a w approach in Ayurveda that we can look at? Yeah, 100%. So the frequency of meals, right? We've kind of gotten, I feel a little sad, Arundhati, because we've kind of gotten into this world where we've kind of lost all intelligence of ourselves. Oh, We're constantly relying upon like, what does this, like, what does this uh, lab say? What does this research say? What does this number say? I mean, one of the examples I use is like, it's like we have all the, let's just say we have really difficult math problems. We have all the answers, but we don't have any of the solutions. Mm -hmm. Imagine if somebody gave you all the answers to a, to a math, but, but does not give you the solutions. Like how, how did we get here? So basically when they do testing in the laboratories, 
because people have messed up so much with their sugar levels because of everything, all the binging, all the snacking, all the more than anything, the stress, they're constantly, you, you stress, more sugar gets yeah. dumped into your blood. So all of this, now we all are experiencing sugar spikes. It's an epidemic in the world. Mm -hmm. To keep the sugar spikes down, then modern nutritionists will tell you, eat little meals throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, eat little meals throughout the day so that your spike is down. And as a result, um, sorry. And as a result, um, you know, you'll, you'll experience more balanced sugar. Now, this is a survival trick. You're not thriving. That means your body is already in survival. And now you're keeping it in survival because you're like, oh my God, like it's very an emergency. Over a long term, this is going to hurt. Mm -hmm. The best is, if you ask me, even for a modern day individual, and I'm going to say why I'm going, before I even give the advice of the number of times, do a little bit of yoga, even if it's asana, do a little bit of breath work, find time to unwind, sleep well. Because what you're doing, you're already bringing those lunar energies in your body. You're not in survival. Mm -hmm. When your body has experienced enough of those lunar calming, rest, repair energies, when your body knows that, you're not going to get those crazy sugar spikes to begin with. And you're in an ideal situation. You're like, I say solar and lunar. Any activity we do is either solar or it's lunar. Solar is day action and lunar is resting. So when you have a good balance of your solar and lunar energies of your own internal day and night, and when you're doing that, then eating two and a half meals a day is ideal. So you never eat a meal, right? And, and if you eat a meal, after the previous meal, before the previous meal is digested. So when we eat too often, the previous meal that's in the process of digestion now kind of becomes this slimy thing. Imagine cooking in a pot, right? Which has a little bit of food left from the previous yeah. meal. And you're like, oh, you know, this is my potatoes are like almost, but I'm going to add some more uncooked potatoes. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the potatoes that are already there will either burn, they'll become slimy, they will never be. So, Breakfast is a warm, small meal. Mm -hmm. Lunch is a big, warm meal again. Mm -hmm. And dinner is dinner should be before 6.30. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, just a little meal, like a very, very small meal, very, very light meal, even lighter than breakfast. Mm -hmm. Is that because uh, your digestive agni is going to sleep at that time? Absolutely. We rise with the sun. We sleep with the sun. We didn't have electricity also back in the day. Mm -hmm. People were not sitting on the dining table and eating big feasts at 9 p.m. Fair enough. Down yeah. After the sun had gone down three hours ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. yeah. No, this is, um, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and it's, a lot of this is just cultural wisdom. There are things you said today and I was thinking of what my grandmother put on us. <laughs> you know? Uh, and so, is there any advice that you would give a modern day, say, yoga practitioner who is trying to live a little more holistically and is trying to explore this relationship with their food? Is there anything, apart from all that we've covered, is there any suggestion or practical tips you want to leave them with? I will say that before your yoga practice, let oil massage let let skin be your channel of consumption and do abhyanga which is the application of oil on your body you can wipe it down with a towel let the residue stay then get into your yoga clothes if you need a drink get some peppermint tea avoid caffeine mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, and then and you eat a date or two don't eat don't do yoga on a full stomach it's my first advice doesn't matter what you're eating if you do it on a full stomach then your body's heat is dissipated from the gut into the extremities and that food will be left undigested that will become toxic and then will start to block your channels so no food when you're exercising in your stomach you can exercise you can do your yoga maybe two hours after you've eaten a full meal or an hour after you've eaten a little meal but not right away that's mm -hmm. the first advice i will give Practice yoga in the morning if you can. But food-wise, I'll say that eat warmer foods, more cooked foods, especially as a yogi. Your practice will go a long way if you don't eat, drink cold smoothies and salads. Raw, uncooked foods, especially for a yogi, can be... Because, you know, the yogi releases energy regularly and the energy needs a lot of grounding. And when we eat all this cold foods, raw foods, etc., 
it can leave the yogi very scatterbrained and and ungrounded. The energy is released, but it's not, it's just, it's like, it's like wind all over the place. Mm. I mean, in simple terms, it's tremendous vata aggravation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So don't, don't eat a meal and go to class and eat cooked food. And uh, if I may throw one in there, don't put a lot of ice cubes in your water and drink super cold water. Like you said, the system's a refrigerator. Uh, cold beverages, I can't even think. Like I'm sitting here with my cup of like warm tea with fennel and uh, carom seeds. Uh-huh. Like I cannot even think. And you know, you start enjoying warm drinks. It's a little hug inside. If you see Asian cultures, you see in those Buddhist monasteries, you go to Japan, you know, people are used to drink. They knew that this is what our traditional Chinese medicine will tell you. You know, all traditional cultures, which have this really deep wisdom about our bodies and our minds will tell you to drink not to drink cold water. Yes. And and going back to, I've said my grandmother a few times, when we were very young, she would not let us drink, um, you know, uh, water in the fridge. In India, in the hot summers too, she would, we, it was really rationed. Um, and I could not understand it. As a six, seven year old, I couldn't understand it. But as I grew up, I was like, yes, now I totally get why she would yeah. not let us drink the bottle in the fridge. Uh so and yeah. I am that mother in New York also, right? <laughs> well, I'm but, glad you are. But no, but I will tell the kids, hey, you know, you, you want to make a lemonade with, with regular water, go for it. Because mm. the, because a lemonade will be as satiating, it's citrus in that, in that same moment, right? And I'm not going to say, I'm, I'm not a Hitler. Once in a while, they want to get their bubble tea, they want to get a dragon drink, from, go for it. But we know that when it's, I'm like, if I have to get sick, I'll get sick with an ice cream. If I have to put something cold in my body, that's what I tell my girls, you know, listen, by all means, but you don't want to do it like you don't want to have this imbalance because of cold water. That's so yeah. blah. Yeah, you might as well have it because of a good ice cream. Fair enough. Uh, no, I, I enjoy I enjoy these kind of conversations. Um, as we as we wrap up, you and I were talking uh, before we started recording. You have recently launched a whole set of new online courses, resources uh, for people. Um, can you share a few more details? Because I know in the audience, people will find value and benefit from it. Absolutely. So Arundhati, I've worked with women for the over the last decade. I myself have had two children. My first born was born. I, I was pregnant 16 years ago. She's 15 and a half right now. And, um, you know, I felt that I come from a family. I carry the legacy of Ayurveda because my grandfather was an Ayurvedic healer. But I realized that we really did not have resources in a systematic manner, authentic and accessible for the modern women. And I put that together in four classes, fertility, pregnancy, which is a very important time because you're building a baby from your own raw materials. You know, the software and the hardware dependent upon you postpartum which is a great opportunity to either reset the body into balance even like more balance than you had before or to push it into tremendous imbalance mm. and then child care right so i've created these four master classes with workbooks resources bundles diet lifestyle mindset exercise every single thing that i could think of a woman requires in each of these phases from this holistic lens one Mm. of the things I don't do is I don't just prescribe and say this is what you're supposed to do this is what Ayurveda says no I try to explain the rationale so it's not information it's knowledge Mm. Mm -hmm. it comes with a knowing oh of course this makes sense right it's like to me Ayurveda is the code of the universe it's not a system of wellness and the code of the universe can be applied to everything and I've applied that to this through the use of Sanskrit text and the and my experience and what I've learned from my grandfather. And yeah, so uh, I would love for people to check it out because it's a resource that was not available to me like that, the way I've tried to create for others. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, I'm I'm so glad uh, that you created it because it is, it is needed and I'm sure there is um, value in there. And you, even if some, like I am thinking, of I'm child free, but I'm thinking of people who I know right now who could benefit from it, right? Oh, and so they know ten it. other people who could benefit from it. So I'm glad you have created this. I know what the work you do is. Uh, it looks people don't realize how much it takes to be to do content creation, online education, the the and and in a world like this, like Ayurveda yoga. So I'm really glad that you are so passionate about what you are doing and you're putting in all the work so that you we do, can you benefit. Do. 
Uh, you okay. too, Arundhati. Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, it's been lovely talking to you as usual. If your listeners, audience need any more information, I'm happy to give you links so that they can you can have it there in the show Wonderful. notes. Wonderful. Well. I will uh, link to your Instagram handle, your website, all your courses in the show notes. Thank okay. you so much, Nimi. As always, Thanks. a pleasure. Same here. Thank you, Arundhati. Thank you so much for listening. As always, I hope you found value in today's episode. Please remember to rate and review the Let's Talk Yoga podcast. It really helps us take this free content to more listeners like you. And if you are interested in studying some yoga with me, Prasad Vikram in the weeks and months ahead, then get on our newsletter right away. I will see you next week with a brand new conversation. Until then, enjoy your practice. Take care. Bye-bye.